Today, resist the creeping madness of central bank digital currencies now. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post, covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, those of you following the channel will know that I've been talking about the central bank digital currency issue for some time. Essentially, there are around 90 different pilots globally where central banks are trying different flavours of central bank digital currency. And in a way, the recent collapse of crypto gives them another excuse to roll out the centralized controlled version of digital currencies. But as I've highlighted previously, there are a whole set of questions. Firstly, it's being imposed top down. Secondly, there are different flavors of central bank digital currency that are not necessarily very useful or helpful. And by the way, can remove freedoms, can make money programmable so that its value can be reduced over time, or indeed can even give central banks further monetary tools. And so this is a very important issue, and yet almost nobody is talking about it. Now, I made a show about six months ago. I'm going to play that in a moment because that show goes into a lot of detail as to what a central bank digital currency is, how it works, what the risks are, and why we should worry about it. But today I wanted just to highlight that there is open a petition at the moment it's actually on the government website. And I do urge you to make your views known with regard to that petition. The wording of the petition is as follows. As Australian citizens, we should be concerned about the disadvantages of a central bank digital currency. Traceability. In the case where physical cash is eliminated entirely, this eliminates our ability to transact in a fully autonomous manner. Negative rates. With central bank digital currencies, you cannot withdraw your digital tokens and hold them under the mattress. If there is no option for physical cash, this gives central banks the ability to implement negative interest rates. Programmability. Central bank digital currencies give central banks a unique opportunity to make money programmable. For example, expiration with a direct relationship with your central bank. Central bank digital currencies could permit a currency expiration policy. Your money could be programmed, so if you don't spend the $5,000 in your account by next Saturday, for example, it'll expire. Personalized monetary policy. With a bank of big data on individual spending habits, coupled with digital identification infrastructure, the central bank will have enough information to tailor its monetary policy personally. For example, if it is known that lower earners have a higher propensity to consume, stimulus can be directly delivered to those people. And personalised monetary policy could even be politicised. A government could segment its voters, identify communities where it is behind in the polls and deliver stimulus just to those groups. So the petition request, well, they've defined it as we ask, therefore, the House to enshrine the use of cash in law. Now, I would argue this is a very important first step, but a lot more will need to be done to ensure that we fully resist central bank digital currencies. But the good news is that already the petition has got nearly 7,600 signed responses, and I urge you to join them. It's pretty easy. You simply go online, I'll put the link below, and provide some very basic information. Receive an email to confirm that it's you, and then you can lodge your vote. But now, here is my earlier show where I explained why this is such a big deal. Well, I have been worrying for some time about the trajectory of central bank digital currencies, and I've been doing a little bit of digging about what might be going on below the waterline. Now, it's interesting that the BIS report that came out recently made some comments about this, and I want to use that as a jumping off point for a more detailed dive. And what I'm going to show you is that central bank digital currencies are alive and well, that there are global forces definitely pushing a particular barrow at the moment, which includes potentially the further deployment of central bank digital currencies to enhance monetary policy, and indeed maybe even on a cross-border basis. This is not good in my view, bearing in mind that I think I would give central banks a fail for their recent history 
of trying to get things under control. Anyway, to start, let's look what they said in the BIS report. A key focus of central banks is the digitalization of finance and money. The 2021 annual economic report featured a special analysis on central bank digital currencies, which laid out how central bank digital currencies present an opportunity for the monetary system. Central bank digital currencies grounded on trust in the central bank offer the unique advantages of central bank money to the general public. Central bank digital currencies should be based on digital identification with institutional and technological safeguards to ensure privacy. That way, money can continue to fulfill its function as a public good and promote an open two-tiered system featuring public and private innovation, resulting in greater access, lower costs and better services. In a speech in early 2022, the general manager of BIS cautioned that current developments in the hinterland of finance could undermine the nature of money as a public good. In particular, decentralised finance, or DeFi, which has seen rapid growth and purports to provide financial services free of intermediaries, may not deliver on its vision. Meanwhile, the rise of big techs and global stablecoins could pose new risks for the monetary and financial system. According to BIS research, DeFi's key feature of decentralization struggles to live up to its promise. Just as it is impossible for firms in the real world to devise contracts that cover all possible business needs, DeFi platforms need some centralization to ensure they can adapt to unforeseen events. Underpinned by blockchains, DeFi must incentivize validators through high fees to ensure integrity. BIS researchers concluded that this has concentrated wealth and power in the hands of a few and kept transaction volumes low. And it could explain why the DeFi ecosystem is geared predominantly towards speculation, arbitrage and investments in crypto assets. There are also questions about whether DeFi's governance and security can scale as the high reward required to entice validators may dissipate as user growth slows. From a financial stability perspective, DeFi poses risks related to investors' high leverage, liquidity mismatches, the lack of shock-absorbing capacity and the built-in connectiveness of the ecosystem. And further, examining news trends, BIS research indicates that the entry of big tech into finance has broadened access to financial services but poses challenges to data governance. Big techs have bolstered financial inclusion by leveraging big data and machine learning to provide cheaper and more targeted products. However, Companies collect and analyse potentially sensitive personal data often without consumers' explicit consent or full understanding. This unconstrained collection of personal data erodes consumer privacy, raising important concerns about data abuse and even personal safety. And the degree of these concerns varies across counterparties as well as across segments of society and countries and illustrates the principle that the technology that can be harnessed to enhance financial inclusion and lower costs could also give rise to closed ecosystems and walled gardens. Technological developments also entail greater onus on policymakers to ensure fairness in the use of technology, for example, artificial intelligence. And beyond concerns about data privacy, the issuance of a global stablecoin by a big tech could entrench market power and fragment the monetary system. Stablecoins are cryptocurrencies that base their value on collateral and thus ultimately on the credibility of sovereign currencies. In case of rapid adoption, the emergence of a closed ecosystem around a global stablecoin could reinforce the loop between data network externalities and activities that underpin big tech's growth. And the same economic forces that foster financial inclusion could also cause discrimination, privacy violations and market concentrations. And in addition, stablecoins could disintermediate incumbent banks and lead to digital currency areas. 
which could have a negative impact on financial stability and fragment global and national monetary systems. Harnessing the benefits of financial innovation and creating an open and global monetary system requires new approaches for public policy. So the BAS believes that a regulatory approach that incorporates entity-based elements could help address the risks stemming from the rise of big tech, such as their provision of critical services to the financial sector. And it's already being pursued in some jurisdictions. And central banks' increasing use of big data from non-traditional sources could enhance such regulation. Regulators also need to ensure that big tech's dominance does not discourage investment in nascent competitors. In the DeFi space, it's important to contain the identified vulnerabilities before DeFi attains systemic importance. And as DeFi applications are borderless and prone to regulatory arbitrage, cooperation among central banks and other public authorities is required and such cooperation could also help to ensure the integrity and stability of money and payments more generally and prevent the abuse of data. Providing digital central bank money to the public, though, could be in the form of a central bank digital currency or as improvements to existing systems, and they could further help to ensure a level playing field and to promote competition. Central bank digital currencies are already being issued or piloted in several countries, and these initiatives have reflected a variety of motives, including financial inclusion. Ensuring the interoperability of payment systems, especially across borders, could be a decisive move in bringing down the stubbornly high costs of cross-border payments. One way to achieve this is by interlinking central bank digital currencies across borders in so-called multi-central bank digital currency arrangements, a step many central banks are considering. Now, back on February the 9th, IMF Managing Director Kristalana Georgieva spoke about the future of money gearing up for central bank digital currency. She said, We've moved beyond conceptual discussions of central bank digital currencies, and we're now in the phase of experimentation. Central banks are rolling up their sleeves and familiarising themselves with the bits and bytes of digital money. These are still early days for central bank digital currencies and we don't quite know how far and how fast they will go. What we know is that central banks are building capacity to harness new technologies to be ready for what may lie ahead. If central bank digital currencies are designed prudently, they can potentially offer more resilience, more safety, greater availability and lower cost than private forms of digital money. That is clearly the case when compared to unbacked crypto assets that are inherently volatile. And even the better managed and regulated stable coins may not be quite a match against a stable, well-designed central bank digital currency. And she went on to say, we know that the move towards central bank digital currencies is gaining momentum driven by the ingenuity of central banks. All told, around 100 countries are exploring central bank digital currencies at one level or another. Some are researching, some are testing, and a few are already distributing central bank digital currencies to the public. In the Bahamas, the sand dollar, the local central bank digital currency, has been in circulation for more than a year. Sweden's Rizbank has developed a proof of concept and is exploring the technology and policy implications of central bank digital currencies. And in China, the digital remindi continues to progress with more than 100 million individual users and billions of yuan in transactions. And just last month, the Federal Reserve issued a report that noted that a central bank digital currency could fundamentally change the structure of the US financial system. And she said there are some lessons to be learned. Lesson number one, there's no one size fits all. There's no universal case for central bank digital currencies because each economy is different. In some cases, a central bank digital currency may be an important path to financial inclusion. For instance, where geography is an obstacle to physical banking. In others, a central bank digital currency could provide an essential backup in the event that other payment instruments fail. One such case was when the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank extended its central bank digital currency pilot to areas struck by a volcanic eruption last year. So central banks should tailor plans to their specific circumstances and needs. 
Lesson number two, financial stability and privacy considerations are paramount to the design of central bank digital currencies. Central banks are committed to minimising the impact of central bank digital currencies on financial intermediation and credit provision. This is very important for the wheels of the economy to run smoothly. The countries we studied offer central bank digital currencies that are not interest-bearing, which makes a CBDC useful, but not as attractive as a vehicle for savings as traditional bank deposits. And we also saw in all three active central bank digital projects in the Bahamas, China and the Eastern Caribbean, they placed limits on holdings of central bank digital currencies again to prevent sudden outflows of bank deposits into central bank digital currencies. Limits on holdings of central bank digital currencies also help to meet people's desire for privacy while guarding against illicit financial flows. Smaller holdings are allowed without the need for full identification if the risks of money laundering and terrorist financing are low. And this could be a boon for financial inclusion. At the same time, larger transactions and holdings require more stringent checks, as you would expect if you deposit a bag of cash at the bank. In many countries, privacy concerns are a potential deal breaker when it comes to central bank digital currencies legislation and adoption. So it's vital that policymakers get the mix right. And the third lesson is balance. Introducing central bank digital currencies is about finding the delicate balance between developments on the design front and on the policy front. Getting the design right calls for time and resources and continuous learning from experience, including shared experiences across countries. In many cases, this will require close partnerships with private firms to successfully distribute central bank digital currencies, build e-wallets, add features, and push the bounds of technology. But the policy aspects are also paramount, including developing new legal frameworks, new regulations, and new case law. On both fronts, a central bank digital currency also requires prudent planning to satisfy policy targets like financial inclusion and avoid undesirable spillover effects, such as sudden capital outflows that could undermine financial stability. Taken together, Careful design and policy considerations will underpin trust in central bank digital currencies. But let's not forget that trust must be anchored to credible central banks with a history of delivering on their mandates. Introducing a central bank digital currency is no substitute for this underlying trust built over decades, a public good which allows money to grease the wheels of our economies. The success of a central bank digital currency, if and when issued, will depend on sufficient trust and in turn, any successful central bank digital currency should continue to build trust in central banks. And she went on to say the IMF is deeply involved in the issue, including through providing technical assistance to many members. An important role of the fund is to promote exchange of experience and support the interoperability of central bank digital currencies. Now that trust thing is really important because I would argue at the moment trust in central banks is at an all-time low, not least because they've really stuffed up when it comes to inflation management and control and quantitative easing and ultra-low interest rates. So asking us to trust central banks with relation to central bank digital currencies to me is a big ask. And if you want more on that, the Fed's paper says a central bank digital currency's design would influence how it might affect monetary policy. Under the current ample reserves monetary policy regime, the Federal Reserve exercises control over the level of the federal funds rate and other short-term interest rates, primarily through the setting of the Federal Reserve's administered rates. This regime does not require active management of the supply of reserves, Expected levels of daily fluctuations in the quantity of reserves generally have little effect on the level of the federal funds rate and other short-term interest rates. But the introduction of central bank digital currencies could affect monetary policy implementation and interest rate control by altering the supply of reserves in the banking system. In the case of a non-interest-bearing central bank digital currency, the level and volatility of the public's demand for a central bank digital currency might be comparable to other factors that currently affect the quality of reserves in the banking system, such as changes in fiscal currency or overnight repurchase agreements. In this case, 
a decline in central bank digital currency that resulted in a corresponding increase in reserves would only make reserves more ample and would have little effect on the federal funds rate. Similarly, an increase in central bank digital currency that pushes reserves lower would also have little effect on the federal fund rate if the initial supply of reserves was large enough to provide an adequate buffer. But over the long term, the Federal Reserve might have to increase the size of its balance sheet to accommodate central bank digital currency growth, similar to the balance sheet impact of issuing increasing amounts of physical currency. This need would be mitigated to the extent that demand for the central bank digital currency represented a shift directly or indirectly away from the Federal Reserve's non-reserves liability, including physical currency. And additionally, the Federal Reserve would likely need to increase the level of reserves on average in order to provide an adequate buffer against unanticipated increases in central bank digital currency. Such surges could otherwise push the aggregate quantity of reserves in the banking system below the ample level and put upward pressure on the federal funds rate. The interaction between central bank digital currency and monetary policy implementation would be more pronounced and more complicated if the central bank digital currency were interest-bearing at levels that are comparable to rates of return on other safe assets. In this case, the level and volatility of the public's demand for central bank digital currency could be quite substantial. Consumers, businesses and potentially others could decide to pay their holdings of bank deposits, treasury bills and money market mutual fund investments and increase holdings of central bank digital currencies. The potential for significant foreign demand for central bank digital currency in this scenario would further complicate monetary policy implementation. Changes in interest rates and other market factors could also significantly affect public demand for central bank digital currency over time. So to maintain an ample supply of reserves, the Federal Reserve might need to substantially expand its holdings of securities. The potential for market developments to have a material effect on the variability in demand for central bank digital currency could also present challenges for managing reserves and implementing policy. Beyond these reserve management effects, a rapidly expanding economic literature has considered the broader potential for interest-bearing central bank digital currencies as a new policy tool with associated effects on the channels of influence in monetary policy. The issues studied include topics such as the potential effects of central bank digital currency on bank deposits and bank lending, the potential effects of central bank digital currency on the economic decisions of households and businesses, and the possible interactions of central bank digital currency with the Federal Reserve's other tools in conducting monetary policy to achieve its macroeconomic objectives. These and related topics are active areas of research that will no doubt yield additional insights over time. And to take that further, a 2020 Fed Literary Review said that central bank digital currencies have the potential to affect central banks' wider policy objectives, either by acting as a new monetary policy tool or through its effects on the portfolio choices of households and the probability of bank runs. Crucial to these mechanisms is the flexibility provided by central bank digital currencies in responding to macroeconomic shocks. For example, under the assumption that newly issued central bank digital currencies exchange one for one with government debt, they suggest that the introduction of central bank digital currency decreases interest rates and distortionary taxes, thus increasing long-term GDP. Over the business cycle, counter-cyclical central bank digital currency issuance can lead to a smaller fall in GDP in response to a liquidity demand shock. This shock leads to a flight to safety in which households demand more central bank digital currency. If the central bank can increase the quantity of central bank digital currency to satisfy this demand, the reduction in real economic activity is less severe, attenuating the decline in spending and therefore welfare. Other analysis highlights an important trade-off. If a run on central bank digital currencies occurs, the central bank internalises the effects on prices and thus real consumption from liquidating its assets to pay depositors by increasing the price level. In the case of a run, the central bank can effectively reduce the real value of withdrawals, thus preventing bank runs from occurring. This increase in the price level, however, comes at the cost of sacrificing inflation targeting. 
Even if a central bank is mandated to maintain price stability, it cannot do so in the case of a large enough run. In this case, the analysis shows that there is a positive probability of runs and the negative interest rate on central bank digital currency during financial panics is optimal to keep inflation in check. And central bank digital currencies might not only be an interest-bearing asset, but also a means of payment alternative to cash, which is subject to theft and to bank deposits, which are subject to limited commitment of banks to honour deposit repayments. When households select interbanked, i.e. deposit users and unbanked cash users, the interaction of central bank digital currency, which pays interest and is assumed to be immune to theft, can be improving and always increases welfare of at least unbanked households. The economic mechanisms driving the welfare implications focuses on the interaction between the new monetary policy tool introduced by the interest-bearing central bank digital currency and banks' limited commitment. Because banks' assets serve as collateral to secure deposit liabilities and relax their commitment friction, Collateral assets play a key role in limiting the amount of liquidity banks can offer households. Interest payments on central bank digital currencies, which are financed by an open market purchase of government bonds, effectively reduces the availability of collateral assets to banks, tightening their collateral constraints and reducing their ability to issue payment instruments in the form of deposits. Thus, despite increasing the welfare of unbanked households, who by assumption are no longer subject to theft, central bank digital currency decreases the welfare of banked households unless they also choose to hold central bank digital currency in their portfolios. With at least some households switching to central bank digital currency, some of the transactions which were carried out with deposits and required banks to hold collateral are now carried out with the central bank digital currency. Banks' collateral assets are still available to issue deposits. Hence, overall, the aggregate stock of collateral can support more transactions and the liquidity of properties of central bank digital currency as a means of payment offers a set of feasible policies available to the government in periods of financial distress. If the financial conditions of banks are private information to each bank and its depositors, the introduction of central bank digital currency as an alternative means of payment to bank deposits but immune from the risk of bank runs as the central bank does not perform maturity transformations results in depositors withdrawing their funds from banks in times of stress and reallocating them into central bank digital currency. By observing a large and sudden inflow of funds into its digital currency, the central bank can then infer the financial conditions of banks. This information might be crucial in designing an appropriate policy response in times of stress. The more so, the faster a response is needed to be effective. By appropriately choosing the interest rates on central bank digital currency to make it more attractive in times of stress, the central bank can more quickly infer the state of the financial system and respond more effectively. This allows the government to adopt policies that are welfare improving over the best policies feasible without a central bank digital currency. OK, enough of the long waffle words. Let's try and boil it down. Point one, central bank digital currencies are being explored by multiple central banks around the world and agencies that sit above them, like the BIS in the United Nations, are talking about cross-border central bank digital currencies. Secondly, the argument is made that by moving funds into central bank digital currencies, the central banks have greater control over monetary policy. They can, for example, change the interest rates on deposits at central bank digital currencies and indeed go negative, if they need to, to control the system. And thirdly, they envision a future where, in fact, payments may be made through central bank digital currencies that information is retained about those transactions and, of course, they can be tied back to individuals. Indeed, in the case of China, as I've discussed before, central bank digital currencies are available for those with an appropriate social score. So if you stand back, this is one about more control. 
Two, it's about enhancing and elevating the role of central banks and giving them more power. And three, these decisions are being taken by unelected entities across the world. I have a problem with this. I think we need much more open public debate about the role of central bank digital currencies in the context of what I've discussed. Because at the moment, this is being imposed top down. The Bank for International Settlements, the banker's banker, through the central banks and through the United Nations and, in fact, other global entities too. But my question to leave you with is, what gives those people the right to try and dictate and determine this sort of set of outcomes, which, by the way, would also absolutely blow up cryptos and other distributed finance alternatives. So there is a future here which, frankly, does not impress me. It worries me greatly. But it seems to me that we are sleepwalking into this future. And if you join the dots between these various discussions, which, by the way, is why I went through this in some detail. It might have been a bit boring, but very important to listen to their own words. You can actually see an architecture here, an architecture which I, for one, am not at all comfortable with. So there you have it. This is a very, very important issue. You have your chance to have your say. Make sure that you do. This is Democracy in Action. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.